Today's movie is a special request from Patreon supporter Vernon C. Hansel, who asked me to review the movie Bad Channels. And with all the Patreon episodes lately, you may be wondering if I got behind again. Yep, I sure did. <laughs> Oh yeah, time to once again enter the crazy world of B-movie mastermind Charles Band. Bad Channels is a 1992 horror comedy produced by Charles Band and distributed by his company, Full Moon Features, which is the company formed after his previous company, Empire, folded. If you remember, Empire also made the movies From Beyond and Terror Vision, and in fact, Bad Channels was also made by the same director as Terror Vision, Ted Nicolau, and deals with some similar themes. While Terror Vision was about how television rots your brain by beaming in alien turd monsters which proceed to eat your family, Bad Channels is is about how radio rots your brain by letting alien turd monsters kidnap our women. People were worried about a lot of weird things in the 80s and 90s, usually involving alien turd monsters. And the movie even has a soundtrack by Blue Oyster Cult. Blue Oyster Cult also made the song Godzilla, so... maybe that'll tide people over until the next Godzilla video. Bad Channels, the WB story. So we open on a power plant, which I think somehow managed to rule 34 electricity. Oh, well there's your problem, the Transformers got a head cold. A uh, John Holmes head cold by the looks of it. Holy shit! Oh shit, that guy just got opening teaser to death. Well, whatever happened doesn't seem to have affected this radio station, which is a apparently broadcasting polka music? That's right, Lisa. Uh, we broadcast over 666 kilohertz on the AM band. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is a Charles Band movie, thank you very much. Now, because of the superstition about the number 666, we're the only 666 in the entire country. <laughs> I've said it before and I'll say it again. Polka is the devil's music. The station's hosted by shock jock Dangerous Dan O'Dare, who's currently staging a publicity stunt where he's tied up in chains and playing the same polka record over and over, and can't stop until someone phones in and correctly guesses the combination on his lock. People, I'm trying to give away a Tsukiyama off-road convertible for 20 hours, I've been chained to the wall. Come on, man, this stunt is never gonna work. Just do what Howard Stern did back then and get some strippers to blow an intern or something. Somehow Dan's stunt is popular enough to make the local news, although I don't know if the listeners are into what's happening. Ritz, why don't you get a haircut? Yeah, joke's on you, pal. That didn't come from his head. And this stunt seems like it's a little tame by Dan's standards. Your last job in radio got you in a lot of trouble. What on earth were you thinking when you broadcast that live sexual encounter between yourself and uh, KLSO's drive-time traffic reporter, Police Sergeant Holliday? I don't know, maybe he thought it would lead to being a judge on America's Got Talent. Dan may be blasting the same polka record over and over, but it's still better than most of the music in Hard Rock Zombies. And you are not gonna believe how Dan gets out of his chains. Give me three numbers. Well, for some reason the numbers uh, are a one, and a two, and a three come to mind. One, two, three. <laughs> That's amazing! I've got the same combination on my luggage! Now that Dan's free of his chains, that means he can finally blast some real music. Things that bother you never bother me. I feel happy, I'm fine, ha -ha. Yeah, crank that shit. However, local reporter Lisa has some doubts about how Dan got the combination. You bribed Flip Humble to promote this stupid marathon on CWN. You rigged the contest. Well, congratulations, lady. You just discovered how the entire entertainment industry works. Now that Lisa's found out Dan's a fraud, this is really gonna hurt his chances of getting Eric Bogosian's role in talk radio. They also see a UFO, but instead of pulling in Orson Welles and convincing people there's an alien invasion, Dan just plays the latest Spin Doctors single. I'm gonna give you a lesson in the power of radio, lady. By the time this is over, you're gonna be begging me for an interview. Yeah, yeah, Tom Likas said the same thing. Turns out a UFO really did land, though, and oh shit, it's the alien from without warning. Somebody better call Jack Palance. Alien! Alien! 
However, since Jack was busy winning an Oscar in 1992, I guess we'll just have to settle for having Dan as our hero. I want to remind you of ancient Chinese proverb. Women who chase after little glean men have to settle for little glean pekka. Wait a second, a radio personality who uses the word pekka? Hey look, a bunch of cranes to lift my pekka. Look at that, my fucking pekka's big. Yeah, I can lift my fucking pecker with these. Hmm, I think Jim Norton's gonna sue somebody. Or this movie should sue Jim Norton since it came out before he did that. Meanwhile, the police find the guy from the beginning, and it looks like the alien gave him a really bad chest cold. Ugh. Forget that, though. I don't think the station's manager knows what to do with Dan. I'm going out for a few hours. Do me a favor and make sure he doesn't say anything that puts me into a lawsuit. Again, it's the early 90s. Doing offensive shit on the radio is how you get famous. Just get Tracy Lords in to queef the Star Spangled Banner and you're guaranteed success. Something also ends up going wrong at the radio station. Turns out the world wasn't quite ready to hear Boys to Men's End of the Road. Plus, I think the alien might have something to do with this. Oh yeah! Great, the station just got invaded by some weird fungus-headed alien and a Star Wars prequel robot. Okay, actually, according to Wikipedia, these two were called Cosmo and Lump, even though they're never called that in the actual movie. I'm not sure which is which, but assuming this is Lump, I'm guessing his last name is Of Shit. Look at that! Yeah, bad news, fellas. That ain't a weapon. Prepare to be probed, assholes. All right, actually, he just takes over the radio station. This alien really wants him to play more Color Me Bad, and that's not the only thing he's doing to people. I have to run some tests to be sure, but it looks like the nastiest case of tinea cruris I've ever seen. Commonly known as jock itch. Well, it's that guy's fault for not changing his underwear after going to the gym or encountering an alien life form. Meanwhile, the alien continues to take over the radio station, and ugh, would it kill this guy to sneeze into his fucking sleeve? Sadly, H.R. Giger's attempts to design a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant didn't go over too well. And don't look so freaked out, Dan. If you can find a couple porn stars willing to fuck that thing live on the air, you're guaranteed to have the number one show in the country. And that's not the only thing these aliens can do for you. Oh shit, the alien just invented dubstep. It's at this point we learn the alien's true purpose, namely to insert random musical sequences. Yeah, turns out this is another movie that has several musical numbers in it in order to pad out the runtime. Although in this movie's case, I think they might be a little behind the curve. Listen, fellas, this movie was made in 1992. You should really be playing grunge, not hair metal. Well, at least it's nice to know Jesse from Hard Rock Zombies shaved his molestache and moved on to girls who are over 18. And if you're wondering what the alien's real plan is, he uses radio waves to shrink women down to doll size and put them into bottles in order to take them back to his home planet. Makes sense. I can see the apparatus. I can see the girl. She looks real. Yeah, I guess the effects are alright for a low-budget movie. Unfortunately, the alien zaps Dan's producer, but we do make an important discovery about the fungus he's infected people with. The, the fungus! It's reacting to the radio. Yeah, turns out these boogers like to boogie. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, no one seems to think anything weird is going on. A little while ago, Corky fought with the aliens trying to rescue a 12-inch girl from a, a glass bubble. Whatever, Opie and Anthony did the same gimmick in 2003. The aliens use their equipment to steal another girl, which means we get another music video segment, although this one is a little bit different than the last one. A grungy song with a music video set in a gym involving cheerleaders? As if that idea would ever take off. And I think I have an idea of what this song might be about. Touching myself again. Touching myself again. I'm just touching myself again. Yeah, here I go now. Alright, well I always said the world could use a male version of Sheep Op. 
Looks like the aliens captured another girl, although that still doesn't explain who the girls on the poster are supposed to be. Or just who in the hell this is. At least the authorities seem to have finally clued in that something weird is happening. How's it going? It's no use, Sheriff. The screen stuff seals up as fast as I can cut it. There's gotta be some other way in. What about a trap door or a skylight or something? Trap door? It's a radio station, not the friggin' Bat Cave. Unfortunately, the alien doesn't appreciate being interrupted. He was just about to start the Led Zeppelin Power Hour. Ugh, this whole station looks like it could use a mega dose of Sudafed. Well, it looks like the alien's getting ready to kidnap another girl, which means we're in for another music video segment. So, what's this one gonna be like? <laughs> I'm not a fan of Oingo Boingo stuff after Weird Science. This whole movie seems like it was made for Beavis and Butthead to talk over. But since they didn't, I guess that means it's up to me. <laughs> Whoa! Hey, Butthead, check it out! That guy's got like four wieners! <sighs> Those are udders, dumbass. So that means he's got boobs on his crotch. <laughs> yeah, I bet when he goes to take a whiz, he pees out milk. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, fellas. Your collection of early 90s Bratz dolls is almost complete. Uh, hi, baby. <laughs> Dan tells the authorities to blow up the station. Good thing the alien doesn't seem to give a shit about what's going on. Hey, Dan? This is Roger. Your show is really the funniest show I've ever heard. Wow. You suck really yourself, ready. Roger! The F word? I'm ruined! Dad, don't worry. In a few more years, nobody will give a fuck. And besides, Dan has bigger things to worry about. I've been infected with the alien fungus. It got into my hand and it went bad, so I lopped it off at the wrist. Fortunately for him, though, he manages to find a solution. Hold the presses, ladies and gentlemen. There's something happening here, and it might be good news for the danger man. Just spray the alien fungus with germosol. That's right. Turns out the aliens can be defeated by tough actin' tenactin. Eh, this is still a less lame weakness than the aliens from Signs. Eat this, scrotum head. No, don't spray the alien with that. Without the fungus on his head, he looks like a giant penis. It'll get this video flagged. Unfortunately, it doesn't prove to be enough. Dan really should have used Lotrimin. I'm also not sure why the alien kidnaps direct-to-video Crispin Glover here, but I guess even these Barbies need a Ken. Okay, actually, he was trying to get Lisa, which does not make the alien happy. Ah, uh, come on, Charles, what are you doing? You don't kill the cute robot, you merchandise the shit out of him. I mean, didn't George Lucas teach you anything? Well, that does it. Now that the aliens captured Lisa, Dan has no choice but to... actually do something. But how is he gonna defeat the alien? Hmm, getting stabbed in the heart. The alien's one weakness. Well, actually, the alien isn't quite dead yet. Aha, uh -huh, so the alien was really disguised as... another alien for some reason. You know, given that there's been musical numbers in this movie, I think it's only fitting that I do this. I'm just a mean green mother from outer space and I'm bad. I'm just a mean green mother from outer space and it looks like you've been had. Dan manages to save the girls, and if they really want to get rid of this alien, they should try spraying it with weed killer. Oh, we're still going with the jock itch thing? Okay, sure. Well, thanks for rescuing the girls, Dan. However, you're still behind man-cow in the ratings. And so, Dan saved the day, got the girl, and eventually went on to become Frank Stallone. But wait a second, weren't there four girls the alien captured? Yeah, <laughs> she's gonna be tiny forever. Her life is gonna be a living hell. Believe it or not, despite being one of Full Moon's lesser-known titles, this actually managed to get a sequel. Well, kind of, anyway. Characters from the movie went on to appear in Dollman vs. Demonic Toys, which was a crossover movie between two other Full Moon titles, which is why the movie has an after credit sequence involving the character Dollman setting up the next movie. Huh. I wonder if Marvel executives are fans of this movie. 
I can also kind of see why this movie wasn't as popular as some of Full Moon's other titles, because like a lot of the Patreon requested movies I've done recently, this is another one that isn't very long, yet still feels like it should have been shorter. Even though it clocks in at less than an hour and a half, parts of the movie still feel like they're stretching for time, and if you took out the musical numbers, it'd barely be over an hour. Despite being made by some of the same people and having a similar tone as Terror Vision, in my opinion, that movie was a lot more fun. But just like how Terror Vision taught us about the dangers of watching too much TV, Bad Channels has a valuable lesson about listening to the radio, which is why you should only get your entertainment from the internet. Mainly because we don't have to follow FCC guidelines. Yet. Well, that's all for now. Until next time.